paper cuts everybody attend o reader our tale of science fiction i got those backwards <laughs> uh won't be the first time won't be the last uh like i was saying welcome back to paper cuts uh last time on paper cuts we read a couple of short stories uh that seemed pretty fun uh honestly one of them uh the inside kick uh, it, it genuinely felt like something that could be made today. Uh, it probably is something that has been had takes made on it uh, in the present day. Uh, I could run it as I could run something similar as a monster of the week game for crying out loud. Uh, I've also been looking into powered by the apocalypse uh, space themed games because I've been watching a lot of spaceship sci-fi lately. And so that's where my brain's at. But anyway, I digress. Uh, we read in Sidekick, which was a short story. We read. Uh, did we read? Did we read Week on Square Roots? No, no, no. We skipped Week on Square Roots because I've read it before. There was another one. Uh, the Repairman. That's what it was. Uh, it was a guy who was looking to repair a uh, hyperspace beacon. And it turns out he needed to emulate the locals' uh, religion that they had built around the hyperspace beacon because they know how to, because their bodies handle radiation in a specific way. I believe that was this that was that one in a nutshell. Uh, and then we started in on the radio planet, which is where we're getting started today. Uh, we are starting in on chapter five, six, seven, eight. Uh, chapter eight. But why radio? Let's dive in. Three fields of magic were open to him. Rifle, fire, aviation, and radio. The opportunity for building a workable airplane among people who knew no metal arts was obviously slight. To make a radio set should be possible if he could find certain materials and other natural products, which ought to be available in almost any country. But easiest of all would be to extract iron from the ore which he'd observed on his journey across the mountains, forge rifle barrels and simple breech mechanisms, and make gunpowder and bullets. Therefore, it's plain why he did not attempt to build airships, but it's hard to see why he did not make firearms rather than a radio set. Firearms would have enabled him to equip the Vikings, for, their kings rather, for by, battle against the Formians, whereas radio would serve no useful purpose uh, at the moment. <laughs> Sounded like a good dance pun to me. We are on chapter 5, 6, 7, 8. <laughs> That's a good one. I didn't even mean to do that. Nice. Uh, radio would serve no useful Yet he took up the radio. I think the explanation lies in two facts. First, he wanted above all to get in touch with his home in Cupia, find out the status of affairs there, and give courage to his wife and his supporters, if any of them remained. Then secondly, he was primarily a radio engineer, and so his thoughts naturally turned to radio and minimized its difficulties. There would be plenty of time to arm the Verkings after he found out how affairs stood at home. So he broached to Judd his project of constructing a radio set, which would necessitate extended journeys in search of materials. But the Bear King Noble was singularly uninterested. I know, I don't remember this guy's voice, so Bear King Noble gets old man voice. I know that you can spin interesting yarns, but I do not know whether you can do magic. Why then should I deprive myself of the pleasure of listening to your stories just for the sake of letting you amuse yourself in a probably impossible pursuit? First you must convince me that you are a magician. Then perhaps I may consent to your further attempting magic. Very well. Tomorrow evening I shall display to you some of the more simple examples of my art. Meanwhile I shall spend my time concocting mystic spells in preparation for the occasion. Then he bowed and withdrew, thanking his lucky stars that he'd learned a few tricks of sleight of hand while at college. Miles now recalled several of these and devoted most of the succeeding day to preparing a few simple bits of apparatus. Then he practiced his twix... His twix. <laughs> twix for kids. No. Then he practiced his tricks before the golden-furred quiven to her complete mystification. <laughs> Sorry, if I replace some R's with W's early on in, in the stream tonight, uh, it's because I've been dunking on spam callers all day. Uh, so whenever I get a spam call, uh, you know how they play back like a recorded hello to try and get you to say hello? 
Uh, yeah, I've picked up on the fact that they do that. And uh, anytime I get a call from a phone number I don't recognize, I don't say anything initially in case it's actually an important call. But then if they just go, if they give me like a recorded hello, uh, I will, <laughs> I'll respond with that. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello, why are you contacting me on my cellular device? You know, just maximum uwu because they can't use that recorded voice for, you know, getting the next person for the spam call. And it makes me laugh, which is the best part. So while they're wasting my time, I at least get to enjoy myself. Hello, Atkinson. Glad to see you here. Uh, I've completely lost my place in the book because I was regaling you all with the tale of defeat the spam bot. Oh my gosh, I have like this whole extended bit about a, a cat who has stepped upon something hot and burned their poor beans. It's it's a whole thing. Uh, make sure on spam calls to never say yes or any kind, kind of affirmative. Good point. I've also been deliberately avoiding yeses. Uh, but I've been like just essentially improvising nonsense to entertain myself while this while the script they have spinning uh freaks out because they're usually like just barely able to understand the things I'm saying through the nonsense voice I'm putting on uh you know just woo -woo type stuff and uh I I very much am just enjoying it anyway now that I've gotten thoroughly distracted from the book 3 paragraphs in uh, let's resume. That evening, he went again to the quarters of Judd the Excuse Maker. Yud? Judd? Did I decide on Judd or Yud? I feel like I was flipping back and forth between them. We're going with Yud this time. Uh, that evening, he went again to the quarters of Yud the Excuse Maker. The same group was there as on the evening before, and in addition, several other Verking men and their wives. After an introduction by his host, the Earthman started in. First he did, in rapid succession, some simple variations of sleight of hand. He had wanted to perform the well-known restoration of the cut handkerchief, but unfortunately the Verkings possessed neither handkerchiefs nor scissors, and he was forced to improvise a variant. Taking a piece of stick which he had brought with him for a wand, he stuffed a small part of one of the gaudy hangings through his closed left fist between the thumb and forefinger, so that it projected in a gathered-up point about two inches beyond his hand. Then, pulling the curtain over toward one of the, the stone open-wick lamps which illuminated the chamber, he completely burned off the projecting bit of cloth. Evidently, this was one of Judd's, choice Judd's choicest tapestries, for the noble emitted a howl of grief and rage and leaped from his divan, scattering the reclining beauties in both directions. If he'd interfered in time to prevent the burning, it would have spoiled the trick, but as it was, the confusion caused by his onrush played right into Cabot's hands. Miles stepped back in apparent terror as Yud seized his precious curtain and hunted for the scorched hole, but there was no hole there. The curtain was intact. Yud looked, looked up sheepishly into the triumphant face of his protege, who thereupon stated, You do not need to worry about your property in the hands of a true magician. Oh, I was not afraid, Yud the excuse maker explained. Oh, I merely pretended fear so as to try and confuse your magic. Please do not do it again, the Earthman sternishly admonished him. The Verking noble seated himself again, and his guests were enthralled. This was a fitting climax for the evening. The amateur conjurer bowed low and withdrew. Quiven was waiting for him at his house, and he reported and reported that someone had torn a small piece out of one of the tapestries. Several days later, she found the piece, but alas, there was a hole burnt in the middle. The next morning, Yod the excuse maker called at the quarters of Cabot the furthest. It was a rare honor, so Cabot answered the door in person. Yod expressed his conviction that the Earthman really was a magician, after all, and that therefore he, Yod, was agreeable to an expedition. To the mountains in search of rocks whose mystical properties would enable the performing of even greater magic. It was soon arranged that Cabot, with a bodyguard of some twenty Verking soldiers and a low-ranking officer, should start on the morrow. Miles was thrilled. Now he was getting somewhere at last. 
The rest of the day he devoted to preparing a list of materials for which he much hunt, which he must hunt to make a radio telephone. To make a radio telephone sending and receiving set, he would need dielectrics, copper wire, batteries, tubes, and iron. For dielectrics, wood and mica would suffice. Wood was common, and the Verikings were skilled car carpenters and carvers. For fine insulation, mica would be ideal, and this mineral ought to be procurable somewhere in the mountains, whose general nature he had observed to be granite. Correct, Gariki, this is the Cabo Cabo story. <laughs> Unlike the one we were improvising the other night, uh, this one's on. This one is not on purpose. Uh, Cabo is the last name of our main character. For those of you unaware. Anyway, to make copper wire, he would need copper ore, preferably pyrites, quartz, limestone, and fuel. The necessary furnaces he'd make, he would build out of brick. Anyone can bake clay into bricks. For cement, Miles finally hit upon using a baked and ground mixture of limestone and clay, both of which ingredients he would have at hand for other purposes. The Verkings used charcoal in their open fires, and this would do nicely for his fuel. For the wire-drawing dyes, he would use steel. This disposed of the copper questions, and brought him to a consideration of iron, which he would need at various places in his apparatus. This metal could be smelted from the slag of the copper furnaces, using an appropriate flux, such as floor spar. Cabot next turned his attention to the power source. For some time he debated the question of whether or not to build a dynamo. But how about the storage batteries? He wasn't quite sure how to find or make the necessary red and yellow lead salts for the packing plates. This, thus, by the time that Cabot had reached the contemplation of having either to find or make his lead compounds, he decided to turn his attention to primary cells. The jars could be made of pottery, or from the glass which was going to be necessary for his tubes anyhow. Charcoal would furnish the carbon elements, zinc could easily be distilled from the zinc spar if that particular form of ore were found. Salt and ammoniac solution could be made from the ammonia of animal refuse, common salt, and sulfuric acid. I guess there is no shortage of sulfuric acid here on Venus. I was like, wait a minute, sulfuric acid, that's hard to find. Nope, not here. Mass production of zinc carbon batteries should thus be an easy matter, and they would serve perfectly satisfactorily, as neither compactness nor portability was a requisite. The radio man accordingly abandoned the idea of dynamos and accumulators in favor of large quantities of wet cells. The tubes, it appeared to Miles, would present the greatest problem. Platinum for the filaments, grids, and plates had been fairly common in nugget form in Cupia, and so could presumably be found in Varkinia. Glass, of course, would be easy to make. Alcohol for laboratory burners could be distilled from decayed fruit. But the chief stumbling block was the how to exhaust the air from his tubes and how to secure magnesium for use in completing the vacuum. These matters he would have to leave to the future in hope of a chance idea. For the present, there were enough elements to be collected that he would be kept busy for a, many, a great many days. Accordingly, he copied off the following two lists. Materials readily available. Wood, wood ashes, charcoal, clay, common salt, white sand, animal refuse, decayed fruit, materials to hunt for, mica, copper ore, quartz, limestone, floor spawn, galena, zinc ore, platinum, chalk, magnesium. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little too into the, uh... The Full Metal Alchemist reading ingredients that I said chalk a little weird? It's fine. But that afternoon, all his plans were disrupted by a message reading, To the Furless One, You are directed to appear for my amusement at my palace tomorrow. You are directed to appear for my amusement at my palace tomorrow. Fail not, Theof the Great. Well, that puts an end to my trip, he said to Quither. How do you suppose his majesty got wind that I'm a conjurer? One of his guests at the show last night must have told him. But something in her tone of voice caused Miles to look at her intently, and something in her expression caused him to say, You know more than you tell. Out with it. Whereat Quiven shrugged her pretty golden shoulders and replied, Why deceive you, though you're so stupid that it's very easy? Who brought you the note from Arculu, from Arculu the night of your arrival here? Uh, you did? Why didn't I put two and two together before? That you're connected in some way with Arculin. 
She laughed contemptuously. How'd you guess it? Yes, one would rather say I am connected in some way to Arkilu, for I'm her sister, sent here to spy on you by connivance with the chief woman of Judd's servants, who is an old mute, old nurse of ours. I am Quivin the Golden Flame, daughter of Teof the Grim, and it is from me that he learned of your mystic abilities. What do you think of that, beast? I think that all you, although you are truly a Golden Flame, you ought to have been named Quivin the Pepper Pot. Whereas she suddenly burst into tears and rushed out of the room. Funny girl. Miles commented to himself as he laid aside the list prepared for his prospecting trip and set about the concoction of some stage properties for his forthcoming command performance before the king. It was a sulky Quiven who served his meal that evening, so much so that Cabot playfully accused her of putting poison in his stew. This didn't render her any more gracious, however. If I did not love my sister very much, I would not stand for you for one moment. The rest of the meal was eaten in silence, during which Cabot had an idea. So when the food had been cleared away, he asked the Arad maiden, Can you smuggle a note to your sister for me? Yes, and I shall tell her how you're treating me. At which he could not refrain from remarking, Do you know, Quiven, I believe that you're falling in love with me. You beast! Oh, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you! And she turned her face to the wall. Come now, I don't mean to tease you. We must both think of your sister. The note, how long will it take you to deliver it in return? Shall I hurry? Yes. Then it'll take me less than one twelfth of a day. That'd be quite sufficient for his plans. And so accordingly he wrote, Akilu the Beautiful, send word how I can see you after the performance, but beware of Yud, Kabo the Magician. This note he folded up, placed it in the, in the palm of Quiven, and closed her golden fingers over it. Whereat she sprang back with, Don't you dare touch me like that! and rushed out of the house, sobbing angrily. Really, he must be more careful with his delicate creature, for although her intense hatred furnished him considerable amusement, it was yet possible to go too far. He must be at least polite to the sister of his benefactress. But there was no time to be given over to worrying about Quiven's sensitive feelings, for the note had been sent merely to give him a slight respite from her prying eyes, in order that he might sneak out for a conference with Yud. Of course, he had no intention of any secret tryst with Arkilu. Heaven forbid when he loved his own distant Leela so intensely. So he hurried to the quarters of the Varkinian noble, who received him gladly, being most interested in learning whether there was any rational explanation to, the give, to be given about the various magic tricks of the evening before. But Miles blocked his inquisitiveness by the flat assertion that all were due to mystic spells and talismans alone, and then got rapidly down, <laughs> and then got rapidly down to business, for there was no more time to be lost. Miles told Yud of the note from Teof the Grim requiring his presence at the royal palace, and how he suspected that Princess Arkelu was responsible. Also, he related his discovery that his maidservant was Quiven the Golden Flame, but he had the decency to refrain, refrain from implicating the head of Yud's menage. Menage? That's probably how you say that. I shall have her removed at once, the Vale King asserted. No, no, that would never do. For now we know that she's a spy, it'd be easy to outwit her, but a new one we never could be sure of. Then he told how he had gotten rid of Quiven for the evening by sending over the note to Harkaloo. Yud's brow darkened. Uh, but that note will serve a threefold purpose. First, it has enabled me undetected to pay this visit to you. Secondly, it will allay Arkaloo's suspicions. And thirdly, it will stir you to block my appearance before Teof tomorrow. Oh, I would have done that anyhow, Yud insisted. My plans are all made. I shall send a runner to Teof, and warn him to search Arkaloo's room for your note. When he finds the note, he will certainly cancel the arrangements for your performance. Thus will the note serve a fourth purpose. Return now to your quarters, and I will send you word of the outcome. I wouldn't if I were you, for a message from you would reveal to our fair young spy the fact that my secret interview with you this evening took place. Let Teof himself send the word. So be it. You can count on starting your expedition tomorrow as planned. Good luck to you. Good luck to you, Yud the Great. And may you win Arkaloo the Beautiful. 
and so the Earthman hastened back to his quarters, where Quiven, on her return, found him placidly reclining on a divan. For a few moments they chatted for a few minutes rather, they chatted playfully together, and then she suddenly narrowed her eyelids, looked at him with a peculiar expression, and asked, Aren't you the least bit anxious to know what answer Arkalu made to your note? That was so. He had written Arkalu a note, but now that it had served its purpose, he almost had completely forgotten about it. How could he spare himself with little quibbing by flattering? Well, of course I'm anxious to know, but I was so glad to have you come back again for the moment I neglected to ask you. Quiv and the golden flame pouted. Now you're teasing me again, and I won't stand for it. But I really want to know. Please do tell me about your sister. I gave her the note. Just then there came a loud pounding in the gate outside. So loud, in fact, that the sound penetrated within the house. Quiven stopped talking. She and Miles listened intently. And the pounding continued. Evidently, we're to have company this evening, he remarked, glad to change the subject. Oh, I forgot to do my mouth stretches, so now I'm full of yawns. Quiven <sighs> replied, Such a racket at this time of night can mean naught but ill. Let us approach the gate with care and question the intruders. So saying, she took down one of the hanging stone lamps, and opened the outside door. It was a typical dark, silent, fragrant Peruvian evening, except for the fact that the darkness was broken by the glare of the torches beyond the wall, and that the silence was broken by the pounding of the gate, and that the fragrance was marred by the smoke of Quiven's lamp. Who's there? To this there came back the preemptory shout. Open quickly, in the name of Teof the Grim. The golden girl recoiled. Even Cabot himself shuddered as he realized the evident cause of the disturbance. His plot with Yud had produced results far beyond what they had planned, and Teof, upon seizing the note, had decided not merely to cancel the sleight-of-hand performance, but also to place his daughter's supposed sweetheart under arrest. I'm afraid your, your father has intercepted my letter to your sister. I tell you what, you leave by the rear door, make your way to quickly to Arkilu, and see if the two of you can intercede for me with your stern parent. And so saying, he released her. The slim princess handed him the light and sped into the interior of the house. Uh, cease your noise, for I, Miles Cabot, the Minor Miles Cabot the Minorian, come to unbar the gate in person. He strode down the path. Quickly he slid the huge wooden bolts, swung the gate open, and stepped outside, shielding the lamp with one hand to get a view of the disturbance. But his lamp was instantly dashed from him, and his arms bound behind him. His captors were about a dozen barracking soldiers in leather tunics and helmets, some carrying wooden spears and some holding torches, while their evident leader was similarly clothed, but armed with a sharp wooden rapier. As, the, as soon as the prisoner was securely bound, the guard hustled him roughly off, roughly off down the street. Thus were his plans rudely dashed to the ground. On the preceding night, all had been arranged for his trip to secure the elements, for the construction of a radio set with which to communicate with Cupia and his Leela. That morning he had been forced to postpone his trip in order to perform before Teof the Grim, and this evening he was Teof's prisoner, slated for... What, exactly? Oh... You will have to excuse my yawning. Usually I do some, like, vocal warm-up so my face muscles don't require me to yawn so much. But not this time, apparently. I promise this book is not what's making me yawn. This is actually quite interesting. Let's dive into chapter 9, Prisoner. 
The squad of Verking soldiers, with Miles Cabot as their prisoner, had traversed nowhere near the distance to the palace when they turned from the street through a gate. Where are they going to take me now? Miles wondered. This question was soon answered, for the party entered a building which was evidently a dwelling of the better class. The hall was well lighted so that Miles blinked at the sudden glare. The leader of the party placed himself squarely in front of his prisoner, with hands on his hips, with hands on his hips, and remarked with apparent irrelevance. Well, we fooled Quiven, didn't we? The prisoner stared at him in surprise. It was Yud, Yud disguised as a common soldier, and Cabot laughed with relief. You certainly gave me a bad 144th part of a day, he asserted. I didn't recognize you in your street clothes. What's the great idea? Oh, I, I got that backwards. That's our main character. You certainly gave me a bad 144th part of a day. I didn't recognize you in your street clothes. What's the great idea? The great idea, to quote your phrase, is that I did truly represent Teof the Grim. He authorized me to arrest you in his name. The pretty little spy will report your capture to Arkelu, and her father was stonily refused to reveal why, where you are imprisoned. Meanwhile, I shall give the golden one time, the golden one time to escape, and you shall then send a second squad to seize your effects. Your expedition will start immediately. Come, unbind the prisoner. As soon as his bounds were loosed, Miles warmly grasped the hand of his benefactor. You are all right. You've completely succeeded without having anything, to, leaving anything to explain. I always succeed and never have to explain anything, Yud replied a bit coldly. And so, late that night, the radio man, dressed in leather tunic and helmet, and armored with tempered wood rapier, set out with his bodyguard for the western mountains. In silence and with the minimum of lights, they threaded the streets of Yud's compound, then the streets of the city until they came to the west gate where a pass signed by Teof the Grim gave them free exit. There they moved west, due westward across the plains, with scouts thrown out to guard against any contact with moving and roving roys. By daybreak they had reached the cover of the wooded foothills, and there they camped for a full day for much-needed rest. Finally, on the second morning, following their stealthy departure from, from Berkingi, their journey really started. The commander of the bodyguard was an intelligent youth named Crota. During the meals at the first encampment, Miles described to Crota in considerable detail the particular form of copper pyrites which furnished the bulk of the copper used for electrical purposes on the continent of Cupia. After listening intently to the description for about the fifth time, Crota smiled and said, oh, We Verkings place no stock in pretty stones except as playthings for our children. But I do recall the little golden cubes with which the children of one of the hill villages are accustomed to play Tom Tom. In this village, Sir by name, is only a day's journey to the southward. Let us turn our steps, steps thither and learn from the children where they get the toys. Oh, from the out of the out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, the Earthman quoted to himself. And so they set out to the southward following a trail which wound in and out between the fertile silver-green hills, which were, for the most part, scantily wooded. Toward the close of day, Crota's scouts established contact with the outpost of the village which they were seeking, and after an exchange of communications by a runner, the expedition was given free passage to proceed. Shortly thereafter, they came inside of the village itself. From among the surrounding verdant rolling terrain, there arose one rocky eminence with a precipitous side, and a flat summit on which stood the village of Sur, surrounded by a strong wooden palisade. Up the face of the cliff there ran a narrow zigzag path, caught in the living rock, and overhung by many a bastion from which huge stones could be tumbled or molten pitch poured on any invaders so rash as to attempt the ascent. Along this path the expedition crawled in single file, with many pauses to draw their breath, and before they reached the summit, Cabot realized full well how, full well how, that how it was. Let's try that again. Cabot realized full well how it was that Sur, the southernmost outpost of the Verkingian civilization, had so long and so successfully withstood the onslaughts of the wild and savage rulers. 
The inhabitants, furry varicates, turned out in large numbers to greet the visitors and especially to inspect the furless body and the much overfurred chin of the Earthman. Guides led the expedition to a large public hall where, after a speech of welcome by the headsman of the village, they were fed and quartered for the night. Between the meal and bedtime, the visiting, the visiting soldiers strolled out to see the sights by the pale pink light of this unseen setting sun. Cabot and Crota together walked to the west wall to observe the sunset. As the two of them leaned on the parapet, a rattling noise on the rocky walk beside them disturbed their reverie. Looking down, they saw three furry children rolling some small objects along the ground. With a slight exclamation of surprise and pleasure, the Verking soldiers swooped down upon one of the youngsters, scooped up one of their toys, and handed it to the Earthman. Uh, Tom Tom. Wait, no, this is Crota. Tom Tom. Crota laconically announced, and sure enough, it was one of the small game cubes to which he had described his companion. But before the latter had the slightest opportunity to examine it, the bespoiled infant let out a howl of childish rage and commenced to assail Miles with fists, teeth, and feet. Stop that! Crota shouted, grabbing him by one arm and pulling him away. We don't want to keep your tum-tum. We merely want to look at it. This gentleman's never seen a tum-tum. <laughs> Gentlemen, the boy replied from a safe distance. Come and soldier! But Miles Cabot was too engrossed to notice the insult. The small cube in his hand was undoubtedly a metallic crystal, but whether calcopyrite or not, he couldn't tell in the fading light. In light, in fact, it might be the sunset which gave the stone its coppery tinge. Taking a small flint knife from a leather sheath that hung from his belt, Miles offered it to the child in exchange for the toy, in spite of Crota's gasping protest at the extravagance. The boy eagerly accepted the offer, remarking, Thank you, sir. You should take off those clothes. It was a very neat and subtle compliment. Gentlemen Verkings never wore clothes. Kabo was impressed. What's your name, my son? He asked, patting the furry little creature on the head. Tell Mother Bree. I shall remember that. And then he hurried back to the public hall, eager to examine his purchase by the light of the old flares. Sure enough, it turned out to be really pyrites, and by its deep color, probably a pyrite rich in copper. To the radio man, it meant the first tangible step toward the accomplishment of the greatest radio feat ever undertaken on two worlds, namely the construction of a complete sending and receiving set out of nothing but basic materials in their natural state without the aid of a single previously fabricated man-made tool, utensil, or chemical. To this day, Miles wears this cube as a pendant charm in commemoration of that momentous occasion. As he lay on the floor of the public building that night, the Earthman reviewed the events of the day until they came to the episode of the purchase of the cubical pyrite crystal from Little Toma. Your name, my son? Cabot had asked him. My son, thought Cabot. I have a son of my own across the boiling seas on the continent of Cupia, and a wife, the most beautiful and sweetest lady in Poros. They're in dire danger, or they were many months ago when I received the SOS which led me to return through the skies to this planet. Oh, I wish I could learn what the danger was, and what has happened to them since then. Thus he mused, and yet when he came to figure up the time since his capture, he was able to account for less than three weeks of Earth time. Perhaps there was still a chance of rescue, if he would but hurry. The danger which had inspired his Leela's call for help was undoubtedly due to the return of Prince Yuri across the boiling seas. For all that Miles knew, Princess Leela and the loyal cap and the loyal Cupians were still holding out against their renegade prince. The message which Cabot had ticked out into the ether from the radio station of the ants had only been sent a few days after the SOS. If received by Leela or any of her friends, it had undoubtedly served to encourage them to stiffen their resistance to the usurper, and if received by Yuri, it had undoubtedly thrown him into the fear of the great builder. Musing and hoping thus, the Earthman fell into a troubled sleep, through which there swirled a tangled phantasmagoria of ant-men, cupians, whistling bees, and verkings, with the occasional glimpses of a little blue-eyed blonde head, sometimes surrounded by golden curls and two dainty antennae, but sometimes completely covered with golden fur. 
Shortly after sunrise, he awoke and roused Crota. No must time, no time must be lost. The princess Leela must be saved. But there was nothing they could do until their host brought the food for the morning meal. From the bearers, they now ascertained that the Tum Tum cubes were gathered in a cleft in the rocks only a short distance from the village, and that although the perfect cubes were rare and highly prized, the imperfect specimens were present in great quantities. In fact, hundreds of cartloads had been mined and picked over in search of perfect cubes, and thus all this ore would be available in return for the mere, sh mere trouble of shoveling it into carts. As soon as arrangements could be made with the headman of Sewer, Cabot and his party, accompanied by guides, crept down the narrow zigzag path to the plain below the village, and proceeded up a ravine to the quarry, where they verified all that had been told. It was a beautiful sight, a rocky wall out of a cleft in which there seemed to pour a waterfall of gold. But on close inspection, every cube was seen to be nicked, or bent, or out of proportion, or jammed partway through or into another cube. The soldiers, both those from Verkingi and those from Sewer, scrambled up the golden cascade and started hacking the crystals out of the solid formation, in search for perfect cubes, while their two leaders watched them with amusement from below. All at once there came a shriek, and one of the Ver Kings toppled the whole length of the pile, almost at Cabot's feet where he lay perfectly still, the wooden shaft of an arrow projecting from one eye. Ruiz! Crota shouted. Instantly, every member of the party took cover with military precision behind some rock or tree. They had not long to wait, for a shower of missiles from up the valley soon apprised them of the location of the enemy, so the Verkings thereafter remained alert. Those who had bows drew them and discharged a flint-tipped arrow at every stir of grass or bush in the locality where the missiles of the enemy had come. We know not their number, he whispered to Cabot. And since we have accomplished our mission, let us return to Suez as speedily as possible. Uh, agreed. The withdrawal was accomplished as follows. Crota first dispatched runners to the village to inform the inhabitants of the situation. Then, leaving a small rear guard of archers and slingers to cover their retreat, he formed the remainder of the expedition in open order and set up for Sur as rapidly as the cover would permit. The enemy kept pretty well hidden, but it was evident from the increase of arrows and pebbles that their numbers were steadily augmented. Noting this, Crotus sent another runner about, ahead with this information. It now became necessary to replenish and relieve the rear guard, of which several were dead, several more wounded, and the rest tired and out of ammunition. This done, Crota ordered the main body of his force to take cover, to leave cover and take up the double quick. The result was unexpected. A hundred or more Ruiz yelled charging down the ravine, through the Verking rear guard, and straight at Cabot's men, who at once ran into cover again, and took deadly toll of the oncoming enemy. But the Ruiz so greatly outnumbered the Verkings that the tide could not be stemmed, and soon the two groups were mingled together in a seething mass. The first rush was met spear on spear, and the sharp wooden swords were drawn, and Cabot found himself lunging and parrying against three naked furry warriors. The neck was the vulnerable spot of the Ver Kings, and it was this point which the Ruiz strove to reach, as Cabot soon noted. That simplified matters for guarding one's neck against such crude swordsmen as these was easy for a skilled fencer such as he. Accordingly, one by one, he ran three antagonists through. Just as he was withdrawing his blade from his last victim, he noted that Crota was being hard-pressed by a burly Roy swordsman, so he hastened to his friend's assistance. And he was just in time, for even as Cabot approached, the, the naked Roy locked, knocked the leather-clad Verking's weapon from his hand with a particularly dexterous sideswipe, and thus had Crota at his mercy. But before the naked one could follow up on his advantage, the Earthman buried his own sword like a spear, and down went the Roy, impaled through the back, carrying Crota with him as he left. Cabot suddenly paused to draw breath, and was viewing with satisfaction the lucky results of his chance throw when a peremptory command of YIELD behind him caused him to wheel about and confront a new enemy. The author of the shout was a massive furry warrior with a placid, almost bovine face, 
which nevertheless beckoned considerable, betokened considerable intellect. And to whom should I yield if I did yield? Miles asked, unarmed to the poise, facing unarmed to the poise sword of his new enemy. Rod the Silent, King of the Ruiz, was the dignified reply. I thought that At the Terrible was king of your people. That is what At thinks, too, the answer was given with a slight smile. But that smile was short-lived, for Miles Caveau, having momentarily distracted this opponent's attention by this conversation, stepped suddenly under the guard of the furry grod and planted his fist square on the grod's fat chin. Down crashed this king, his sword clattering from his nerveless hand. In an instant, Miles snatched up the blade and bestrode his prostrate foe. Just as he was about to plunge his point into Grodd's vitals, there occurred to him the proverb of Poblath, while enemies dispute the realms of peace. With Grodd the Silent and At the Terrible both contending for the leadership of the Ruiz, Verkingia might enjoy a respite from the trepidations of the wild and lawless race. He would leave the fallen Roy for dead, rather than put him actually in that condition. Accordingly, he sprang to the aid of his companions. Frodo was already back in the fray, his own sword in his hands once more, and the sword of his late burly opponent slung at his side. Quite evidently, he did not intend to be disarmed again. Three Verking common soldiers and Crota and Miles now confronted seven Ruiz. This constituted a fairly even match, for the superior intelligence and leather armor of the men of Erkingi and Sur offset the greater numbers of their aboriginal antagonists. What the outcome would have been, we'll never know. For at that moment, the reinforcements from the village came charging up the ravine, and at the same instant the top of the cliffs were lined with Ruiz, sent a shower of arrows upon those below. The contending twelve immediately separated. Pebo and his followers passed within the protection of the rescuers, and the return to Sewer was renewed. The commander of a rescue party threw out a strong rear guard, and the Verking archers on both flanks peppered the cliff tops with slingshot and arrows, but the mar marauding Ruiz harassed every step of that retreat. There was some respite when Cabot's party reached the village where stood the rocky peak with the village of Sewer on its summit, for the arrows could not carry from the cover of the surrounding woods to the foot of the rocks. But as the third party began, at the, as began the ascent to the narrow path on the face of the cliff, they noted that the Ruiz were forming solid banks of wooden shields and advancing across the plain. What do you think, Magnus? I think I'm sleepier than I thought. Let's see if I can grab some water without disturbing the boy. Yeah, it's okay. You can stay there. We do, in fact, have a Magnus. <laughs> partially on my lap right now for those interested mm -hmm. Easy. Okay. Huh? you just want to sit here and listen to papa read Sounds good to me. He's just a little guy. That's all he is. Oh. Harassed every step of the retreat, I believe that's where we were. There was some respite when Cabot's party reached the plain where stood the rocky peak with the village of Sur on its summit, where arrows could not carry from the cover of the surrounding woods to the foot of the rocks. But as the tired party began the ascent of the narrow path on the face of the cliff, they noted that the Ruiz were forming solid banks of wooden shields and advancing across the plain. <laughs> Those are good emotes, RNL. Thank you. Arrows now began to fly from below at the ascending Verking party, several of whom toppled and fell down the face of the cliff. 
and then the warrior just above Miles on the narrow path clutched his chest with a gasp and dropped square upon the Earthman, who braced himself and caught the body, thus preventing it from being dashed to pieces at the foot of the rocks. Whether or not the furry soldier was dead could not be ascertained until... Oh, excuse me. Until Miles should have reached the summit. So up he toiled with his burden until he gained the protection of the palisade. Palisade, rather. Where he laid the Bear King gently on the ground and tore open his leather tunic to see if any life were present. The wounded man still breathed, though hoarsely, and his heart still beat, but there was a gaping hole in the one side of his chest. No arrow protruding from that hole, Miles tenderly turned the man over to see if the wound extended clear through. And it did, almost. From the man's side there projected the tip of a bullet, the steel-sheathed tip of a leaden rifle bullet. Chapter 10. The Siege of Sir. You ready for the Siege of Sir, Magnus? You think I'm ready for you, Pet? <laughs> yeah? You want to just say... You say wherever you like. As long as I can see the words on the screen, we're fine. Yeah. Miles quickly extracted the bullet from the back of the wounded bear king. Then, tender furry female hands bore the victim away, as the earth man stood in thoughtful contemplation of his find. There could be no doubt of it. This was a steel-jacketed bullet, identical with those used in the rifles of the ant-man. How comes such a weapon in the... How came such a weapon in the hands of the savage and untrained Ruiz? It was inconceivable that these uncultured brutes had overwhelmed Newformia and capt captured the weapons of the ant -Man. No, the only possible explanation was the Formians had formed an alliance with the Ruiz, and were either fighting beside them, or at least furnished them with a few firearms, the use of which they had taught them. But this last idea was improbable. Due to the well-known shortage of rifles and ammunition at Uriana, capital of the new ant empire. No, if the ant-men were in an alliance with these furry savages, there must be ant-men present with the besiegers, and the shot in question must have been fired by the claw of a formian. This opened up new terrors for the village of Sewer and its inhabitants. Miles glanced apprehensively at the southern sky, half expecting to see and hear the approach Oh, the approach of a Formian plain, but the radiant silver expanse was unmarred by any black speck. Sir was safe for the moment. His musings thus completed, Miles hurried to the public hall to communicate this discovery to Crota and the village authorities. He found the head man already there in conference with Crota. Said Miles, exhibiting the bullet, Here is one of the, ma uh, here is one of the magic stones thrown by one of my own magic slingshots which is capable of shooting from the ground to the top of your cliffs and even penetrating the palisade. It's big magic. With its aid, the Ruiz can overcome, with, overcome us. Without it, I am powerless. Therefore, we must secure possession of it. What do you suggest? Crota replied, It is now sun. It is now sunset. Let us select a squad of picked scouts and try to stop the camp of the enemy. No, no, the headman of Sir exclaimed in horror. Never have our men dared to attack the Ruiz by dark. Do the Ruiz know this? Most certainly. Then, all the more reason for attempting it. They'll be unprepared. The magistrate shrugged his fury, furry shoulders with, If you could betray, if you could persuade any minister to attempt something so foolhardy, I'll interpose no objections. Within a twelfth of a day, Crota had enrolled twenty scouts, and with Miles Cabot they had all begun the stealthy descent of the narrow winding path down the face of the cliff. Before starting, they had observed the direction of the Roy campfires on one of the surrounding hills, so now they crept quietly toward that hill, and slowly up to its crest. In spite of the dense blackness of the Peruvian night, they were able to find their way, first by starting in the correct direction, and then by keeping the lights of their own village always beside, behind them. As Cabot had expected from the remarks of the headman, there were no sentinels on post, for the enemy were quite evidently relying on the well-known verking fear of the unknown terrors in the dark. Indeed, it spoke volumes for the individual courage of the twenty-one members of this venture. 
and for their confidence in their Earthman leader that they had dared to come at all. Finally, the party finally the party emerged from the underbrush at the top of the hill, a few score of feet from the tents and campfires of the Ruiz. There, motioning the others to remain where they were until he gave a signal, Miles crawled forward, always keeping in the shadow of some tent, until he was able to peek through a small bush beside one of the tents, directly at the group around one of the campfires. Just as Cabot arrived at this observation position, a royal warrior was declaiming, I told you it would work, but I had not seen, for I had not... I told you it would work, for had I not seen it demonstrated fully to me? You yourself saw it kill, now will you not believe me? I cannot understand its principle. How can a weapon kill afar and yet resemble neither a sling or a bow? Show us how it works, and then we'll be persuaded. I don't believe that he has it. The original speaker, nettled, spoke again. It's, my, it's in my tent there, you doubters, indicating the one beside which... Indicating the one beside which Cabot had crouched. Quick as a flash, Cabot wriggled beneath the back of the tent into its interior. The campfire light, penetrating through the slit opening in front, revealed nothing but rumpled blankets on the floor and ordinary weapons slung to the tent pole. So the intruder commenced rummaging around the bedding. The conversation outside continued. Prove or be silent. You saw the Verkin fall, didn't you? True, but I didn't see you sling any pebbles. Meanwhile, Cabot continued his frantic search. At last, it was rewarded. In one corner of the tent, his groping fingers closed upon a Formian rifle and a bandolier of cartridges. A thrill ran through him at the touch. Prove it to you, I'll get it for you. And if you don't believe me, I'll slingshot you with it. That ought to be enough to prove, even for a stupid one like you, I've said it. That's the signal for my exit, Miles said to himself as he hastened to crawl out through the back of the tent. But then he reflected, Mm, no, I want more than this gun and ammunition. I also want information. And so he remained. As the Roy entered the tent and felt for the rifle, the crouching Earthman flung himself upon him, and before the startled furry one could even utter a gasp, strong fingers closed upon his windpipe, throttling off all sound. The struggle was over in a few moments. When Miles Cabot finally crept out of the enemy tent, it was with a limp. It was with a limp form under one arm and a bandolier and a rifle slung across his shoulders. The conversation at the campfire continued. One of the warriors was saying, Our friend takes long to find his wonderful slingshot. He thinks he was lying, does not dare to face us. Let us pull him from his tent and confront with him perfidy. At this, Miles sprang to his feet and ran to the cover which concealed his followers. Uh, Rush in among them as we planned, while you two come with me. Then, he, then on he sped down the hillside toward the lights of Sewer with his captive and the trophies of two previously picked members of the band, while Crota and the remaining eighteen charged, yelling in the midst of the Roy camp, upsetting tents, scattering campfires, and laying about them with, the, laying about them with their swords. Straight through the camp they charged, shouting, Make way for all the terrible, at the terrible! Then they circled the hill under the cover of darkness, and rejoined Miles. The startled Ruiz were taken completely by surprise. From the cries of Crota and his followers, they assumed the terrible the intruders were Ruiz, partisans of At the Terrible, attacking them for being partisans of Grod the Silent. As they came rushing out of their standing tents or crawled from beneath such tents as been wrecked, they met others of their own camp, similarly rushing or crawling and mistaking them for enemies, started to fight. The confusion was complete, and never for a moment did the naked furry savages suspect that a whole trouble had been caused by a mere handful of their kings. Truly, as Poblath the Philosopher has said, while enemies dispute, the realm was at peace. While the Roy followers of Grog the Silent fought among themselves until they gradually discovered there was no one there except themselves, Miles Cabot and the Verkings carefully rega- carefully and safely regained the village of its sir, with a rifle, ammunition, and still the unconscious Roy warrior. In the public hall, under the tender ministrations of Verking maidens, who would rather have him plunged who would rather have plunged a flint knife into him, the captive finally regained his senses 
and looked around him in bewilderment. Where am I? In Sir. Then we're victorious? Never before has a Roy foot set foot in Sir. No, your forces are not victorious. You're a prisoner. It's only by the grace of Cabo the Minorian that you're permitted to come here even as a prisoner. For the men of Sir take no prisoners and give no quarter. In reply, Miles himself stepped forward. I myself am Cabo the Minorian. To which Crota added impressively, the greatest magician of two worlds. Prisoner shook his head. I only know of one world, and this man before me is dressed as a mere common soldier, as are all of you. Uh, know then, O oh scum of Poros, the Earthman admonished, that there are other worlds beyond the silver skies, and in the world which I come from, all soldiers are gentlemen. But the Roy warrior was not to be subdued by language. How did I get here? You didn't come here. You were brought. I brought you. How? By magic. What magic? My magic cart which swims through the air as a reptile swims through the waters of a lake. True, there be such aerial wagons, for I have seen them near the city of the beasts of the south. Mark well, Miles interjected with, to the assembled Verkings, then to the prisoner again. I captured you because you possessed the magic slingshot and presented to you, presumed to use it on one of my own men. This effrontery could not be permitted to go unpunished, hence your capture. The offending weapon is now mine, and you are my prisoner. What do you propose to do with me? I propose to ask you some, or rather, I propose to ask you some questions. First, where did you get the magic slingshot? The great magician knows everything. Why, then, should I presume to tell him anything? But the Earthman remained unruffled. You're correct. I ask, not because I do not already know, but because I wish to test whether it is possible for one of your degraded race to tell the truth. Why well, test that? For doubtless you who know everything know that too. Miles couldn't help but admire the insulting calm with which this furry man of infer this furry man furry man of inferior race confronted his relentless captors. Who are you? Now, who are you, rash one? The prisoner drew himself up proudly with folded arms and answered, I am Otto the Bold, son of Grod the Silent. Hmm, the son of a king. I'm the father of a king. Well, as one man to another, tell me where you got this gun. Gun? Is that the name of this weapon? Know that when I got it from you, know then that I got it from you yourself when I wounded you. Just beneath the tree, outside the brook, at the, pro at the foot of the mountains, before the Verkings of Yus. <laughs> before the Verkings of Yud, the excuse maker, drove me off. I've spoken. And spoken truly, concealing a surprise with difficulty. Of course, why hadn't he guessed it before? But there were still some more points to clear up, so he continued. Why'd you shoot those two arrows at me in the house of... Why did you shoot those ar two arrows at me in the house at the top of the mountain? Because we wished to explore the house, but you com killed my companion, whereupon I resolved to kill you in revenge and capture the noisy gun. Is that the right word? So I trailed you. The rest you know. Remember, I know everything. But did you ever see anyone but me shoot the gun? You know, I never did. No one on Poros, save Cabo the Magician or Otto the, and Otto the Bold, has ever done this big magic. I saw the results, but not the means. So when you killed my companion, I experimented for myself after I'd stolen your gun. And soon I learned how after which I carefully conserved the magic stones till last night, when I shot one of the Verkings of Sir, so as to give the visible proof of my magical powers to my doubting comrades. The Earthman heaved a sigh of relief. There existed as yet no alliance between the Formians and the Ruiz. Pray heaven that such a calamity would never suggest itself to the minds of either race. 
For if so, then woe to our king you. Son of a king, return to your people and your father. Give him my greetings and tell him that you're the friend of a great magician who lent you his gun, who transported you through the air within the walls of Sir, where no Roy, where no Roy has ever stood or will ever stand, and who till last night caused phantom warriors to attack your camp under the guise of followers of At the Terrible. Go now. My men will give you safe conduct to the plain below. That whole paragraph was the main character. Uh, honestly, folks, I'm feeling very sleepy. So once we finish this chapter, I think I'm going to take an early intermission. We're going to do a little bit of a shorter stream tonight. Uh... Wait a minute, no. Uh, anyway, what's the price of this freedom? The friendship of a king's father for a king's son, Miles Gabo replied with dignity. Oh, I know. I just have been sleeping really poorly this week, and I don't want to be reading half asleep. So, as soon as we hit a chapter boundary here, I'll take intermission, and then we'll... Uh, read for another hour. The two drew themselves up proudly and regarded each other eye to eye for a moment. It is well. Goodbye. And he departed under the escort of a Verkin guard. The master knows best, but I should have run the wretch through the body. The next morning, Cabot thanked the headman of Sur for his hospitality and took up the return trail for Verkingi, the vacancies in his ranks being filled by a loan of soldiers from Sur. The party had gone but a short distance where they found the way barred by a formidable body of the Ruiz. But before these came within bow before these came within bow shot of a bullet from Cabot's rifle, brought two of them to the ground, whereupon the rest of them or bow shot of a bullet, rather. Whereupon the rest turned and fled precipitately. Later in the day, a bend in the road brought them suddenly upon a furry warrior. Miles fired, and the man instantly fell to the ground. When they reached the body, there was not even a scratch to be found on it. The bullet had missed. It had a fright, Miles thought. But no, for the heart was still beating, although faintly, and the lungs were still functioning. Sit up. Can't. I'm dead, the Roy replied. Then I'll make you alive again, his captor declared, placing his hands on the back of it. On the head of the Roy. Abracadabra. Kamunya. Thereat the soldier sat up with a sigh of relief and opened his eyes. Stand up. For reply, the Roy jumped to his feet and started running for cover. Halt. Halt or I'll kill you again. The man stopped. Return. And the man returned like a sleepwalker. What do you mean by running away? Now listen intently. Are you one of the men of Grod? Yes. Then go to Otto, the son of Grod, and tell him that it is the order of Cabot the Magician that verking expeditions into these mountains in search of golden cubes and other minerals be unmolested. Tell Otto that he can recognize my expedition by the blue flags which we'll carry hereafter. Now go, I've spoken. The Roy warrior ran up the trail, and his time this time was not halted. Mm, another mistake, Crodo remarked half to himself. The rest of the return to Verkingi was made without event. On the way, the radio man made notes to the best deposits of quartz, limestone, and fluor spar. Also, he carried with him a few large sheets of mica. But he found no traces of galena, zinc, ore, or platinum. These would require at least one further expedition. Crota spared no ex extravagant language in relating to Yud the exploits of Cabot the Minorian in raising the siege of the village of Sur and Yud repeated the story with embellishments to tear off the grin. Also, this long-deferred right-hand performance, or rather, the long-deferred sleight-of-hand performance, was held at the palace to the great mystification of the white furred king. Ooh, yes, good news. Nary a bot rolling up to the stream. Always good news. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kariki. I'm glad you ran through and kind of bonked them all over the head earlier. 
where was I? Arkaloo did not show up to mar the occasion. In fact, little Quiven reported that her sister was very indignant at the Earthman for trifling with her affections, and had turned to Yud in her peak. Needless to say, Yud had taken every possible advantage of Cabot's absence to reinstate himself with the chestnut furred princess. But neither Miles nor Quiven appeared to exhibit any great sorrow at this turn of affairs. So long as Arkaloo's hostility did not become active, the support of Yud and Teoth ought to prove quite sufficient. The standing of Cabot the Minorian as a magician was now well established, and accordingly Yud the excuse maker and even Teoth the Grim were willing to accord him all possible assistance in the gathering of the materials with which he was to perform his further magic, namely Radia. Teoth made a levy upon all the nobles and turned over to the Earthman upward of five hundred soldiers with their proper carts and equipment. Yud himself Quiven, still unknown to her father, and Crota, the soldier who had demonstrated on the expedition an intelligence far above his social class, were enrolled as laboratory assistants. Several enclosures adjoining Cabot's yard were vacated and converted into factories, in one of which were mounted a pair of huge millstones, such as the Verkings use in grinding certain pieces of their food. Miles divided his men roughly into three groups. One group under Crota, he established into clay deposits to the northeast of the city, to make bricks and charcoal. The second group under Yud were engaged in mining operations, digging copper ore, quartz rock, floor spar, limestone and sand at various points of the mountain, and carting some of the limestone to the brickyard and the rest of the other products to Verkingi. The carters carried back with them to the mountains all the necessary supplies for those expeditions. The third group, under Quiven, were engaged in setting up the grist mill and another building in preparatory operations. At the clay pits, the first operation was to scrape off the surface clay and spread it out thin in the open air so it would age quickly. The limestone, upon its arrival at the brickyard, was burned in raw brick ovens and then carted to Bear Kingi to be ground at the mill. It was then shipped back to the brick plant, where it was mixed with the aged clay, first screened, molded into bricks, baked, burned, and carted to Verkingi to be ground into cement. Some of the ground limestone was retained at Verkingi for use in later glass making, and some of the unground for smelting purposes. The bots have been K.O. <laughs> Very good. Other aged clay was screened, moistened, molded, and baked in order to form ordinary brick. Fire brick was similarly made by the addition of white sand, finely grounded Verkingi, but this kind of brick had to be baked much more slowly. Thus, only a week or two after this whole huge industrial undertaking had begun, the radio man was in possession of fire brick and fire clay, with which to start the building of the smelting furnaces. Meanwhile, Miles Cabot, with a small bodyguard, kept traveling from one job to another, giving general superintendence to the work, and when everything was well underway, he set out on another exploring expedition in search of galena, zinc ore, and platinum. Quiven had furnished the inspiration for this trip by suggesting that the sparkling sands of a large river, which ran from west to east about a day's journey north of Verkingi, might contain the silver grains which he sought. And so thither he set out, one morning, with camping equipment and a detachment of soldiers. All day they marched northward across the level plains. Toward evening they reached a small estuary of the main stream, and there they camped. As the silver sky pinkened in the west, Miles Cabot ran quickly down this brook to inspect the sands of the river, which lay but a short distance away. The pink turned to crimson, and then purple. The darkness crept up out of the east, and plunged the whole face of the planet into velvet and impenetrable black. But Miles Cabot did not return to the camping place. Nur, nur, nur. What a great little cliffhanger to head to intermission on. I know it's a little early, but like I said, I'm feeling a little sleepy. I'm feeling a little tired. I'm feeling a little sleepy. It's time for... A BRB. Uh, now is a great time 
to have a little break yourself along with me. Stretch, get hydrated, take medications if that's something you need to do. Definitely pet your animals for me. Tell them hello. Give them some love. Uh, you know, just take care of generalized things. Uh, usually I'd say, you know, oh man, I've been I've been sitting for way too long and I need to stretch. But uh, this time I need to stretch to get some extra energy. So let me bring up the BRB. Uh, there we go. And I will be right back real quick. Just gonna do some small things. I shall return soon enough.
Okay, I think, I think we've got, uh, we got time, we got time. Uh, so we are definitely going to go for, uh, another hour or five total chapters, whichever comes first. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm just sleepy. I'm just big sleepy today. I have not been sleeping particularly well lately, thanks to, in no small part, my cats. Who have decided that it is now their holy duty to awaken me in the middle of the night. Isn't it, boys? So... Apologies. I don't want to sit here and read half asleep. I had a bad habit of that when this was still a radio show. So, uh, and I just don't like how the recordings came out when I was very sleepy and reading. Like, yeah, yeah, they're still listenable, but you can tell I'm like very sleepy and not dictating very well. My mouth is very close. So, like, <laughs> I just, uh, I, I, I'd rather, I'd rather have a short episode where I am a little sleepy instead of the first half of the episode is shockingly listenable. And then he just passes out on the table <laughs> for the second half, you know? Hopefully library will decide that my lap is a good place to be because I'm always happy to have a cat in the, in the frame. Especially because him being in the frame means that he's not going to be causing any problems. Come on, library. Take like, oh no. Oh, the internet can see me. Maybe I shouldn't stand here. Such a nervous little man. He's much more willing to be on camera than Alexis is. Which was, which was kind of a surprise when Magnus laid on my lap earlier. Alright, let's find out why, why Miles uh, did not come back from its journey. <clears throat> his journey onto the river. Let's dive into chapter 11. Ought the terror. When Miles Gabo left his encampment beside the little brook, he hastened downstream to where the brook joined the big river, on the edge along the edge of which there reached a, there stretched a sandy beach. Falling on his knees, he picked up a handful after handful of silver sand. There was still plenty of daylight left for him to examine the multitude of shiny metallic particles. There could be no doubt of it; these sands held some metal which could be separated out in the same manner as that in which the California gold miners of 1849 used to wash for gold, but only time would tell whether or not this metal was the much-to-be-desired platinum which the radio man needed for the grids, filaments, plates, and wires of his vacuum tubes. On the morrow he would wash for this metal, using the wooden spoon, or rather, using the wooden pans which he had brought for that purpose. The precious dust he would carry back to Verkingi, melt it into small lumps if possible, and then try to analyze its composition in his laboratory. As he sat on a sandy beach and thus laid his plans, his thoughts gradually wandered away from scientific lines, and he began again to worry about Leela. It was many days since she had sent the SOS, which had recalled him from Earth to Poros. Whatever she had feared must have happened by now. It was possible that he would never be able to effect a return to Cupia. Why then not do not why not then accept the inevitable, settle down permanently among the Verkings, and solace himself as best he could? Even an ordinary stalwart soul would have been done his would have done his best and been satisfied by that, but Miles Standish Cabot possessed the indomitable will which had given rise to the provo Peruvian proverb, You cannot kill a minority. To such a man, defeat was impossible. He would rescue Princess Leela in the end. That, that was all there was to it. So he laid his plans with precision as he sat on the sandy shore of the Peruvian River in the crimson in twilight. Before the velvet darkness completely enveloped the planet, the Earthman arose from the sands and began his return up the valley of the little estuary. But as he was hurrying along and was passing through a small grove of trees, a dark form noiselessly dropped upon him from the above. The creature lit squarely upon his back, wrapping its furry legs around his abdomen and its furry arms around his neck. Although taken completely by surprise, 
Kabo wrenched the creature's feet apart and then threw it over his head as a bucking bronco would throw a rider, a jiu-jitsu trick which he'd learned from one of the gymnasts at college. The Roy, for that is what Kabo's assailant proved to be, scrambled quickly to his feet, although a bit stunned and crouched, ready to spring at him again. The Earthman planted his feet firmly apart, clenched his fists, and awaited the onslaught. Then, when the creature charged, he met with he met him on the point of the jaw with a well-aimed blow. Down crashed the furry one. Kabo was rubbing his bruised knuckles and viewing his fallen antagonist with some satisfaction when suddenly he was seized around the knees from behind and was hurled prone by one of the neatest football tackles he'd ever experienced. Squirming quickly to a sitting position, he, d he dealt the Roy who held his legs a stinging blow beside the ear. The grip on his knees loosened, and he was just about to scramble erect when a third assailant caught him around the throat and pulled him over backward. Then scores of these furry savages swarmed upon him from every side. Yet still he fought, until his elbows were pinioned behind his back, his eyes were blindfolded, and a gag was placed between his teeth. Thereupon he ceased struggling, not because there was no fight left in him, but rather because he wisely decided to save his strength for some time, when he might really need it. So he offered no further resistance when he was picked up and thrown across a bare pair of brawny shoulders and carried off, he knew not whip. Finally, after what seemed many hours, he was unceremoniously dumped onto the ground and then jerked roughly to his feet. His bandage was, sn his bandage was snatched off and he found himself standing in the center of a circle of flares confronting a large, squat, and particularly repulsive gray-furred Roy, who sat with some pretense of dignity upon a round boulder in front of him. Beside him stood another Roy, evidently the one who had brought him thither. This one now spoke. See the pretty Vare King which I have brought you. If that's a Vare King, then I'm my own father. If he isn't a Vare King, why does he wear Vare King leather armor? Mercury or not, and he will do very nicely to string up by the heels and shoot arrows at. For evidently he is no Roy. What say you to that, my fine target? The guard removed the gag. I say you better not take any such liberties with me. Why not, Furless? Let me ask you a question. Who is the King of the Roys? The Grob the Silent or Arthur Terror? Rod the Silent, most assured. Why do you ask? Do you know Prince Otto, his son? Or the Bold, most assured. Know, then, that I am no Verking, but rather a Minorian, which is a sort of creature I venture you've never met before. Furthermore, I'm a particular personal friend of Otto the Bold. He will not thank you to string up Cabo the Minorian by the heels and shoot arrows into him. I demand that I be taken before Prince Otto. Thereat, the fat Roy smiled a crafty smile. Or I shall take you before off the terror. It thus became evident that this fat chieftain had falsely asserted his belief in the kingship of Grodd for the purpose of securing for Miles an admission as to which side the Earth Man favored. The rest of the night Miles spent on a pile of smelly bedding in a tent. He was still bound and kept under constant surveillance by a frequently changing guard. By morning, his arms below the elbow had become completely numb, in spite of his having loosened his bonds somewhat by straining against them. When the velvet night had given place to silver day, the guard brought some coarse porridge in a rough stone bowl, which he held to the prisoner's lips until it was all consumed. Miles thanked him politely, and then asked if he would mind chafing the numbed arms. For reply, the soldier kicked him savagely. Get up! The time is here for start the march. You'll wish the rest of you were numb, too, when the, the terrible starts shooting arrows in your inverted carcass. Presently, Miles was driven into the open, the tents were struck and loaded onto carts, probably stolen from the Bear Kings, and the furry warriors took up the march, with their prisoner in their midst. The fat chief alone rode in a cart. All the others walked. By straining at the things that bound his arms, Miles further loosened them sufficiently to relieve the pressure on his blood vessels, and then by wiggling his fingers he managed to finally restore the circulation. After that he managed to take some interest in his surroundings. 
His captors were a coarse-looking lot of brutes, with long, gangling arms, thick-set necks, low foreheads, and prog prognathous jaws. In general, they more closely resembled the anthropo anthropoid apes of the earth than they really resembled the human, although fair, although furred bear kings. Their weapons, wooden spears and swords and flint knives, were like those of the bear kings, only cruder. They marched without any particular order or discipline, and jested coarsely with each other as they ambled along. After taking in all this, Miles next turned his attention to the country through which they were passing. The trail led upward into the mountains, and this at once aroused his interest. Here and there he noted what he felt sure must be zinc blend. Yes, and cropping out of the rocks on the left was an unmistakable rosette of Galena crystal. The radio man was sincerely glad that he'd been captured, and so he even joked jovially with the soldiers around him until they became quite friendly. At one point their route lay across a foaming mountain stream by means of a log bridge. As they were crossing over, one of the first soldiers had the misfortune to stumble and in another instant completely lost his footing, plunging headlong into the stream below. He happened to be one who had recently become particularly chummy with a captive. Well, poor fellow, it's too bad he can't swim. I can. Quick, someone cut my cords. And before anyone could interfere, a young and impetuous Roy had drawn his knife and severed the Earthman's bonds, thus permitting him to dive after the poor creature, who was rapidly being washed downstream with a swift current. It had all happened in an instant. A few swift strokes brought Miles up to the other, but it became no easy matter to reach the shore. However, the troop of Roy's showed much more interest in regaining their captive than they had in rescuing their comrade, and thus, by the aid of their spears, finally dragged the two ashore. Then Cabot was bound again, and the march resumed. The carts had detoured, and so the fat chief had not seen the episode. Uh, better not tell him anyone, or it'll go hard with the youngster. Our leader would not relish any chance of not being able to present this furthest verking to the art the terrible. And Ott will shoot arrows into me? Most assuredly. Miles thought to himself, eh, I guess they are right, especially if Ott knows how I was befriended by Arco, whom he covets. Then he asked, When am I to see the terrible one? Tomorrow morning. However, Miles Cabot fell asleep at the encampment that night, wondering when he would get that radio set finished for a talk with Leela, and wondering whether that really was Galena Crystal which he'd passed on the road. But Galini Crystal wasn't going to help him any without the terror. Ugh. Uh. Chapter 12, Companions in Misery. In the morning, Miles Cabot was to be brought before Ot the Terrible, King of the Ruiz, for execution in the diabolical, ma diabolical manner common to these furry aborigines. Namely, by being strung up by the heels and then used as a target for the archery of the king. In spite of this, he slept soundly and dreamed of radio sets and blast furnaces and galena mines till he was awakened by a soft, furry, furry paw shaking his shoulder. A, a voice spoke close to his ear. A life for a life. So you have that problem on this continent as well as in Cupia. Who are you? What do you want? I'm the soldier who saved... Whom you saved from the raging mountain torrent. What I want is to repay that favor. Is it really true that you're a friend of Otto the Bold? Y yes. Then come. The, voice, the forces of Grob the Silent, Prince Otto's father, are encamped but a short distance from here. I'm on guard over you for the moment. Come. While there is yet time. Cabot arose in haste. The other promptly severed the cords which bound his elbows. Oh, how good it felt to have his arms free once more. He held them aloft and flexed and reflexed the lame and bloodless muscles. Excruciating pain shot through the nerves of his forearm, but it was pleasant pain, easy to bear, for it pretended peace and rest to his tired members. He wiggled all his fingers rapidly, and the pain gave way to a prickly tingling which in turn gradually faded off as the blood coursed freely through the veins and arteries once more. He drew a deep sigh of relief. Come on, 
the guard demanded. Together the two left the tent and threaded their way among the other tents out of the camp and down a rocky hillside path, the Roy in advance with Miles following, holding the other's hand for guidance. Miles lost all sense of direction in the jet-black starness night, but the other, born and reared on Poros, hence used to the daily recurrences of twelve hours of absolute darkness, walked sure-footedly ahead, and seemed to know where he was going. Finally, after about two hours of this groping treadmill progress, lights appeared ahead, and presently came the sentry's challenge. Halt! Who is there? Uh, two messengers with word for Grod the Silent. Cabot's conductor replied, and in the side, Cabot intense interestedly to inquire, How does it happen that this camp is guarded, whereas the camp that besieged the village of Sur was not? There's no need to post sentinels when fighting against the Verkings, for Verkings never go out in the dark, but we Ruiz are different. Why, then, did we meet no sentinels when leaving your camp? Because we were going out. We passed one, but he didn't challenge us. Coming back would be different. At that point, the hostile guard interposed. Stop that whispering amongst yourselves. Hoy, a light. Where a small detachment arrived on the double quick with torches. The leader shaded his eyes with one palm and inspected Miles and his companion carefully. This is a fair king, he said in surprise, noting the leather trappings of the Earthman. Your spies, seize them. In an instant, they were seized and bound and thrown into separate tents under guard. When morning came, Miles was fed and then led before Grodd the Silent. The Earthman smiled ingratiatingly as he entered, but there was no sign of recognition on the stern face of the King of the Ruiz. Who are you? What are you doing here? I'm Cabot the Minorian, a recently escaped prisoner of Arthur Do not mention that accursed name in my presence, thundered the King. I do not seem to recall your name, but your face looks familiar. Where have I seen you before? In the ravine, near Sur. I remember you failed me with your fist. <laughs> but you spared me. Why? Because your death would please the Roy whose name you don't permit me to mention. You improve. Know then that we Roy's hold to the maxim of life for a life. Accordingly, I shall set you free and content myself with shooting arrows into merely the soldier who brought you here. You give me a life for a life, unconditionally? Yes. Then give me the life of the poor soldier who saved me from the unmentionable one. Shoot your arrows into my body instead. Very magnanimous of you. And really it makes but little difference to me whom I practice archery upon. Oh, God, bring the other prisoner in. One of the soldiers accordingly withdrew and presently returned with Quiven, Quiven of all persons. Cabot gasped, and so did the golden-furred Verking maiden. Then they both uttered simultaneously, You! The savage chief smiled. A slight mistake, guard. I meant you bring the Roy soldier who was captured with his furthest one early this morning. But evidently it's turned out to be a fortunate mistake, for it has been brought to my attention that the fact that this common Verking man and this noble Verking lady are Acquainted. While the Roy was speaking, an idea occurred to Cabot. He was entitled by the code of honor of this savage race to save a life. Chivalry demanded that he save the life of this maiden rather than that of himself, or even the soldier who had rescued him from out the terrible. Yet what would Leela think? Did he not owe it to Leela to save his own life, in order that he might some day return across the boiling seas to save her from the unknown peril which had menaced her? For him to sacrifice himself and her, or even merely himself, for the sake of some strange woman would fill Leela with consuming jealousy. Luckily, Leela wasn't here to see him make his choice. He was an officer and a gentleman to whom but one course lay open. And if he decided the way that would please displease Leela, then that very decision would forever prevent Leela from knowing. So, his mind made up, he spoke. O oh, king, you still owe me a life. Inasmuch as your guard has made the mistake of substituting this young lady for the Roy warrior, whose life I had elected to save, I now accept the substitution, and elect that you shall spare her life in the place of mine. Quivin the Golden Flame stared at him with tears of gratitude and appreciation in her azure eyes. Grod the Silence smiled knowingly, 
in a manner which infuriated Miles, but fortunately Quiven did not notice, so Miles let it pass. And then the king spoke. We shall see about that later. Meanwhile, guard, bring in the right prisoner. The guard sheepishly withdrew, and soon had returned with a soldier who had befriended Miles. Why did you rescue this furless Viking, who was a prisoner of your forces? Uh, because he rescued me from a mountain torrent, O King, a life for a life. Quite true. But was it altogether necessary to that end that you leave your own forces? No, O King, but I fain would battle on your side. I've had quite enough of the fat one who commands our outfit. Good. We shall need every man we can muster. Thus you have bought your own life and freedom. Unbind him, guards. Give him weapons so that he may fight for us. As for you, the yellow minx, the quicker we get you out of here, the better it'll suit me. We are at war, and women have no place in that warfare. Therefore I gladly give you your life, which this furthest one had purchased. Do not think that I do not know who you are, or that I do not realize that I can hold you for high ransom. But for the present, it suits my purposes to release you, for my mind is a one-card road, and at present I am engaged in an important and highly personal war. Besides, if I were to keep you, my enemy might get hold of you and collect the ransom himself, which would never do. Twelve days from now, if I should be in need of carts, a messenger from me will call at the palace of Teof Grimm. And if you are at all grateful, you'll make me a present of about twenty sturdy wagons. As for you, he turns to Miles, your life is mine since you failed to redeem it. Some day I may call upon you for it, but for the present I wish to use it. You were detailed, as my personal representative, to escort this lady safely of your kingdom. Both of you get out of here, for I have more important things to do. I must put my army on the march. One of the guards stepped up to Miles and cut his bonds. Quiven had not been bound. Uh, may I have arms, O King, that I may fulfill your mission with credit to you? Miles asked with a twinkle in his grey eyes. You keep on improving. Yes, you may. Here, take my own sword. You were a brave man and an able warrior, as my chin well remembers. May the Builder grant that some day we shall fight side by side. And this gave Cabo an idea. Why can that not be now? Why not form an alliance with the Verkingi against the unmentionable one? But Grod the Silent shook his head. No, it cannot be. In the first place, the unmentionable one is himself seeking to make such an alliance against me, and in the second place, this is my own private fight. I have spoken. Then Cabo had a further idea. Uh, about the wagons, would you mind sending them sending for them to my brickyard north of Verkingi, that would be more convenient. Very well. Roar warriors then applied the two prisoners with portable rations and escorted them for quite a distance from the camp until they struck a mountain trail. This, the escort informed them, led to Verkingi. There the warriors left Miles and Quiven alone. The first thing she asked was, With his mountains full of roaring, warring ruins, do we think we were safe? I think so. The very fact that they're at war will keep them much too busy to bother about us. Come on. As they hurried down the trail, each related his or her adventures to the other. Cabos have already been set down, but as for Quiven, she had gone with a few soldiers to hunt for miles after his prospecting party had returned and reported his disappearance by the river. But her party had been killed and she'd been taken prisoner. Did Grodd treat you with respect? Miles asked with clenched fists. Absolutely. I never, I never knew a man so impersonal. I'm accustomed to have men recognize my presence and pay some attention to my existence, but this brute, why, I might as well have just been a piece of furniture or one of his servants. I don't believe he knows now what color my eyes are or whether I'm pretty or not, and you're just as bad as he is. Your eyes are blue and you are very pretty. In fact, you closely resemble my own wife, the beautiful Princess Leela, who waits for me afar across the boiling sea. Which reminds me to ask, how successful was your expedition, apart from being captured and getting into all sorts of trouble? So he told her about the glistening metallic particles in the sands of the river. How he had also found that were what were probably zinc blend and galena. Then they discussed in detail his plans for various factories. From time to time they munched some of the food which had been given them. 
The day quickly sped, and the evening drew near, yet they were still upon the mountain road, with no sight of Verkingi or of any landmark familiar to either of them. Quiven was for stopping and resting, but Miles urged her on. No, no matter how tired you are, it's not safe to stop in this strange country. So she struggled on. The sky darkened without the usual pinking of the west. All too well they knew what that portended, one of the heaven-splitting tropical storms so common on Poros. And they were right. The storm broke, the thunder roared in one continuous volume of sound. The lightning and the rain alike poured down in continuous sheets. The trail became... Excuse me. Ooh, more apparent. The trail became a mountain torrent, so that they had to cease their journey and crawl upon a huge boulder in order to be avo avoid being engulfed by the water. The rain stopped as abruptly as it had begun. Again, the silver sky appeared overhead. The extempore brook rapidly disappeared, but left in its wake a wet, muddy, and slippery trail down which the two took up their journey once more. Several times Quiven stumbled and fell, until at last her companion had to help her in order to keep her going at all. But in spite of this assistance, she finally broke down and cried, I shall not go one step farther. Miles seated himself beside her and talked to her as one would soothe a child. That's what she was, a tired little child. You can't stay here. The ground's damp, the night's coming on, your fur is sopping wet. I don't care anything about anything. All that I know is that I positively cannot go on. So he decided that it would be necessary to change his tactics. I'm ashamed of you. You, the daughter of a king, can't stand a little exercise? Why, I believe you're just plain lazy. For reply, she jumped to her feet in a sudden rage. Oh, you beast, you insulting beast, you common soldier. I'll show you that I can stand as much of your hardship as the pampered women folk of your cupia. Though the men of my country, even our common soldiers, would be gentlemanly enough not to force a lady to endure any more than is absolutely necessary. Oh, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. You're not being forced to endure more than is necessary. In the first place, it is necessary to go on, and in the second place, I'm not forcing you. You can go on or not, just as you see fit. But as for me, I don't intend to spend the night right here in this wet valley. Goodbye. For, re for reply, Quiven raced ahead of him with, Oh, wow, I hate you, and disappeared around a turn the trail. Okay, folks. I am going to call it an evening there. Uh, we will be back, not this Friday, but next Friday. Uh, I'm taking the coming week off uh, because I will be juggling too many limes to stream. Uh, but next week after next, uh, feel free to come back. We will make much, much further progress, ironically, given the next chapter title, uh, in this book. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of a big sleepy. This has been Paper Cuts, and I hope it didn't sting. <laughs>